Hi, this is Simon Dennis, BSC. I'm the director of photography on Hollywood, and you're listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I'm a director and owner of BC Media Productions. This is the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. So today we're speaking with Simon Dennis, BSC. He's the director of photography for my new favorite show, Hollywood on Netflix. This is a Ryan Murphy show, and you know it is. It's got the look, it's got the style, it has the storytelling. It is fantastic. Of course, Simon also worked on American Crime Story and Pose and Peaky Blinders, and we talk about all those things, um, including lighting, you know, camera choices, lens choices, how he's creating this kind of 1940s slash 50s Hollywood look for the show Hollywood, and so much more. So it's a great discussion. You guys are going to love it. All right, let's dive into our interview with Simon Dennis, BSC, the director of photography for Hollywood. So I'm here with Simon Dennis, BSC, the director of photography for Hollywood, and so happy to have you on because I am obsessed with this show. Thank you very much. It's a great honor. You see a whole bunch of shows here that are kind of in that Ryan Murphy family, American Crime Story, Pose. Uh, talk to us about working kind of within that, you know, within that family with him, because he has such a strong visual and storytelling aesthetic. Yes, indeed. I mean, Ryan's fantastic. Um, I mean, I've been working with him for probably three years now, and I will hand on heart and say he's probably the hardest working person I've ever met in the industry. I mean... The success of his shows is a sort of testament to their hard work. And um, what I find exciting is he makes shows that are like entertaining and important, if you know what I mean. And he's not afraid to take on key issues. So, yeah, so I, I kind of came over in 2007 and uh, I was invited by a, a fellow cinematographer, um, Nelson Cragg, who's now a good friend. And um, Oh, we've had Nelson on. Oh, terrific. Yeah. Well, he might have explained too. I mean, he was shooting, he was lining up to shoot the pilot for Fitzarchi, the assassination of Johnny Fitzarchi, which is a part of uh, Ryan's American Crime Story anthology. And um, they'd already done uh, People vs. O.J. Simpson, which was a massive success. And uh, so, uh, oh, long story short, I mean, I was in England, I just finished the shoot, and um, got a, I got a message from uh, Nelson. He, he kept it very simple. He said, I'm doing this show with uh, Ryan. You know, I'm going to shoot the pilot uh, and uh, Ryan's going to direct, but I need somebody to take over from episode two, I think, or three and do the rest of the show. And I honest to God thought it was a joke. I, I, I just replied was like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you know, you could throw a brick out of a window in L.A. and hit, an, you know, a DP on the head. You know what I mean? So, uh, but he was very taken by, um, I did a show called Peaky Blinders in the UK, um, which was a big breakout success. It was a, an amazing show to do and uh, a period too. So, um, so um, yeah, so Nelson basically said, you know, the offer's there if you want to come across. And three weeks later, I was in Fox Studios uh, in a, you know, a room with Ryan and everyone and sort of jumped into the family. I mean, he's got a, such a, like, um, you know, he's got a great, uh, you know, family of talent around him that's been working with him for a good 10 years, I'd say, uh, which is another testament to his, you know, his amazing ability to tell great stories and everyone just loves working with him. So, so yeah, so I came and did Versace expecting to get fired pretty much every day. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you're insecure, you know, I kind of came over, I'm from England, you know, I had to kind of, I was the new guy in the block, you know, I was trying to keep my head down and just do a good job. So wait, had you, had you not worked in LA prior? No, not a day. Really? Yeah. It's, it's the maddest story. I mean, I, I come from Devon in England, uh, which is kind of like the Shire in the Hobbit, if you can imagine that. So I'm a million miles away from LA, you know, literally. <laughs> so, wow. so, um, so when the, you know, when I kind of came over and landed and started shooting, uh, at that point, Ryan Ryan was sort of completing his episode, his pilot, and um, uh, the second episode too. And so I I was joining on episode three onwards. 
Yeah, and that kind of sequentially led straight on to uh, Pose, which was an incredible TV show to shoot uh, set in New York in the 80s. That is on my list. I haven't seen it. I know I'm going to like it. I just haven't seen it yet. Uh, you know, it's, ba it's based on a um, uh, Paris is Burning documentary but set in the 80s with a transgender kind of community. Um, so I did that in New York, and that kind of led pretty much then sequentially onto the the politician, uh, which is uh, sort of a very smart satirical high school kind of um, kind of political analogy, really, of kind of a kid who wants to be the you know the the, uh, the president of his high school, and he'll do anything uh, to to get there. So I did that. Uh, that went well, and then um, that then led on to Ratchet, um, which is uh, Ryan's take on Nurse Ratchet, uh, her kind of origin story. Oh, well, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, you wouldn't have at the moment. It's coming out. We shot this before Hollywood. Oh, is it, it's coming. so is it not released? Not yet. It will be out. Oh, okay. I believe it's later this year. And um, and then basically at the end of Ratchet, I kind of was hearing about this Hollywood project. And I, you know, I'm not going to go hand in cap and just beg for a job, but I just prayed that Ryan, you know, wanted me to kind of continue the kind of relationship. Uh, but also just to say that, you know, Nelson was shooting the actual episodes, the pilots with Ryan. So I didn't actually have, I did a few days with Ryan just picking up stuff, but Hollywood yeah. was the first project I did with Ryan from scratch, from, you know, from, from the first project, from the first episode onwards. But I'd had enough time on set with him to know, you know, just how kind of amazing he is. He's, he's a very, very uh, precise, uh, he, he's got a lot of high standards. He's very, very on it when it comes to set design and costume. And um, the amazing thing I've seen, uh, which is not too often these days, I, I think, is he doesn't ever seem to compromise, like ever. Mm. Like he, he'll just keep going until he get what, what he wants from a scene or a day shooting which is a great quality if you can afford that. <laughs> I'm like fascinated by this. So you came over to do American Crime Story, never have touched foot in LA, at least to work. And then what did you just, you just stayed and went one after another after another? Wow. Yes, it basically is. The, it's it's a little insane. Uh, when I that, is in, that is incredible. So what, back, what? You know, and I mean, thanks to Nelson really, because I mean, it, I mean, I think, you know, there was enough of my work that convinced, I mean, definitely convinced Ryan. I, I believe that Nelson showed him my reel and it was literally like an hour later, he just messaged back saying, come to LA. And I, and I honest to God, still thought at that point, it was, you know, he was having me on, as we say. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I kind of landed and then, you know, um, uh, I, you know, just sort of got some accommodation here and, um, so what was like, what, what was the experience like for you coming in and sort of immediately leaping into such a successful franchise right out of the gate? Well, and also Ryan putting his faith in me to be the person to, you know, take that man on and just run with it. And yes, yeah, I was wide eyed. I have to tell you, I, I, you know, I remember driving into Fox studios and I kept thinking, you know, Hmm. <laughs> some point I might wake up. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, how, uh, how long until you felt like I actually deserve this? Or did you ever get to that point? Were you sort of the whole well, time thinking like, wait a minute, I'm a fraud. This isn't for me. I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> well, it was definitely a fast track into the LA, you know, TV world. And, yeah. you know, I knew about Ryan stuff, you know, in England, he's a success all over the world. So, um, you know, and I knew the standards of his work and I knew um, he was a great voice in, in TV. And I knew also about his like Netflix deal that he had. So um, I don't know. I, I just I felt comfortable when I was shooting. I didn't feel in any way intimidated. Um, I guess I've done enough stuff back in the UK where I've got a little bit of a thick skin, you know. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you you certainly weren't an unknown. I mean, no. Peaky Blinders was a is a huge show and looks amazing. So, I mean, it, it's certainly not, it's not like this, hey, with this brand new kid up and coming, just come on into LA and take the job. I mean, you've certainly had a career, um, but it's just, it's an interesting story to just kind of land here and and have such a great gig. That's amazing. Good for you. It is. I, I mean, hugely luck. I mean, just luck, really. I mean, obviously talent, you know, with the previous projects I've got, but uh, you know, but also, you know, what's funny is I kind of got a fast track in the UK 
TV scene as well because I'd done like three episodes of um, three episodes of TV, and then it just happened to be the director of one of the episodes of Doctor Who that I did, uh, another obviously famous show, was um, was doing Peaky Blinders. So I literally had only done three hours of television, and then I did Peaky Blinders, which was a <laughs> Oh you are the luckiest yeah. person on the planet. I know, right? <laughs> I know. Um, what an amazing story. All right. So let's let's talk about kind of the look of a Ryan Murphy show, because mm -hmm. obviously every show has its own distinct look, certainly different time periods, all that. But for some reason, when you watch one of his shows, you know, it's one of his shows. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to put your finger on why. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yes, I feel. Um, you know, it's a sort of four-way um, department thing. You know, it's very much, um, you know, set design, costume, hair, makeup, and then cinematographer. Um, it sounds really weird to say this, but his shows are kind of easy to shoot um, because mm. there's so much in front of the camera that's just so gorgeous, that's so detailed, that's so thought through and planned and preconceived. I mean, nothing gets by Ryan. He 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 oversees every single inch of the shows, hmm. as well as developing the other shows. I mean, I don't know where he finds the time, but it's um, so. Um, I, I'd say design is a huge part of it, and I know that is what we all do and what we all get involved with. But I think it's even more heightened with his shows. I think it kind of comes across, you know. Um, I mean, Versace was a little gritty. It was you know based on a true event. Um, so there's some sort of naturalism to that sort of show, but it's a sort of heightened naturalism as well. And, yeah. and you know, Pose was a bit more kind of under the, the underbelly of New York, again, a little bit grainy, but there's always a certain element of gloss with his work. That yes, absolutely. It's something that's, it's very, very, um, uh, I think it's, part of his six, six, secret of his success. You know what I mean? Like yep. something very accessible about his stuff. But at the same time, like I said earlier, he'll sew in important key issues that he's trying to deal with or question within entertainment. You know what I find so interesting about the look of the shows? And now that I'm seeing, you know, you, you've been on all of these shows, um, is that it's like, it can fit on a network. It can fit on something like an HBO. It can fit on a Netflix. There's a lot of shows that don't have that cross-platform ability in the way that they look. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, you've really nailed in a look that fits across all of these different types of networks. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. And the shows are all very different, you know, and they're all kind of fresh new shows. What I mean, that was the other thing that I was a little bit, I felt hugely lucky by is that I was coming into LA to shoot a show that was a, you know, a fresh show. It wasn't season nine, you know, and yeah. all of these shows have been, you know, original shows and they all have a very different personality. But again, like you say, they have Ryan's stamp that is, I don't know. It's like trying to find the secret of like of success of like, what's the ingredient for Coca-Cola or whatever, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. It seems to yeah. have found that um, secret formula for what, what is right. And I, I think also, like, yeah, it's just generally, like, it, it is a cross-platform because he is trying to, you know, like, for instance, you know, Pose, originally I remember speaking to Nelson about it, and there was an early concept that it was going to be more taxi driver and a bit more kind of down and dirty. But ultimately, you know, the kind of gloss factor kind of shone through more and was more uh, of a selling factor. And that show is basically about family, you know. So it's... It, it, that there's, you know, you can alienate an audience by going too far in one direction, I think, you know, whereas his shows, they've, you know, from Glee earlier on, you know, nipped up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're everywhere, you know, went as soon as you shoot. I mean, I remember being in, you know, New York with Pose, there was, you know, a taxi drive, a taxi drove past our set and I had a, p a poster of Pose on it. You know, his, you know, he really, you know, um, his shows get out there on the billboards, you know, so it's a big, um, you know, there's always a, a sense that, you know, he sells his products very well as well. You know what I mean? Through obviously great Absolutely. You know, um, advertising and his campaigns are so beautiful. Uh, and the conceiving, even the title sequences I love, you know, even the Hollywood was actually my favorite of all. And um, it's so interesting that you say that because every episode that I've seen, and I've seen five so far of Hollywood, 
I let the intro play. Even though you have that, there are certain shows that I I just want to see the intro. Stranger Things is one of those. I just love it. I love watching the intros. And even though you can skip, there's something about this one that's just so engaging. So it's it's just interesting. And for those listening, Nelson Craig was the cinematographer, American Crime Story, People vs. OJ. He was on back in 2016. So if you want to hear his episode, check out our website. You can listen to that as well. All right. Let's dive into Hollywood on Netflix. Um, tell us about the show for the people that don't know. Um, just tell us kind of what the show is generally about. And also I'm interested in how it was pitched to you. So the show is essentially is a post-World War II setting in Hollywood, 1947 into 48. And it's about aspiring actors and filmmakers who will do basically anything to get into, the, you know, to kind of make their showbiz dreams come true. Yeah. That's the very simple kind of pitch. And, um, you know, Ryan's kind of pitch too, very early on was, was it, it was to be his love letter to this era that is so kind of, um, you know, loved and, and did. And it's almost like a bygone era, right? You know, it's like, it's, you know, whenever you do anything related to Hollywood lighting, it's almost like a pastiche, you know? Yeah. So he wanted, you know, uh, to make the show, you know, uh, in honor of, you know, the, that era, but posing an interesting question, which was, what if you could rewrite the story as in, you know, like making almost like an alternate version of Hollywood yeah, where events can almost change for the better, you know, and, you know, on the surface, the show, you know, you know, his pitch was that it had to feel sassy and vibrant and beautiful and glamorous. And, you know, people are following their dreams and seeking their fortune, but there's an underside to the whole thing where it's kind of, you know, like the Boulevard of Broken Dreams and, you know. Yes. There's a desperation that lies underneath everything. And then more importantly, it's really, really dealing and explores discrimination, you know, race, mm -hmm. sexuality, gender. And it's not just the sort of underdog characters, as it were. It's also within the studio system, you know, the, the abuse of power within that studio, you know, uh, things like that. So that was, that was the sort of... Um, story pitch and then ryan went on to sort of um because normally what happens is we would because the shows are so big and they involve so many departments it's never always a one-to-one -one with ryan he'd always get everyone in the room because it's a massive team effort definitely on this yeah. show you know so you know the pitch he would throw out words like nostalgic optimistic natural wholesome you know and he definitely wanted to go for, for sort of a like a harvest tone palette I guess looks technically hmm. gold. Uh, okay. So that was interesting. And I started to kind of think about that and how I, you know, um, you know, wanted to kind of not go for a sepia TV show, you know, if you know what I mean? Um, yep. Some yep. with more color separation. Well, let's talk about the look of Hollywood. So hmm. period, yep. you know, you have experience with this, with Peaky Blinders. Mm -hmm. Um, but very different look. I mean, Peaky Blinders does not have the saturation and the warmth that Hollywood does. So talk to me about the way that you've realized this vision that Ryan has as far as, like you said, that harvest kind of golden mm -hmm. look. How are you achieving that? What's what's kind of your first step? Very early on, I started to kind of, you know, did the standard research and I would watch a bunch of movies, you know, the classics, Casablanca and Notorious and uh, other references from Ryan, like Dark Passage and I Walked With a Zombie. And then there were like Technicolor movies that uh, were sort of three strip Technicolor, not two, because that was the previous decade. So we were th looking at things like The Red Shoes, Black Narcissus, you know, even Gone With the Wind, which was a little bit earlier. Um, so what we ended up, what ended up pitching to Ryan was a fusion between basically film noir and Technicolor. Not full-on film noir lighting, you know, in that kind of deep mood, but definitely a sort of nod to the film noir kind of genre. You know, I think you, if you've seen some scenes in, um, you know, like some of the offices, you'll notice there's a lot of, um, you know, wooden slatted blinds. Yes. That gave us this kind of slatted light motif that we kind of sewn into some of the scenes and sets. So, um, so that's where the kind of look, to derive from from just pure research and just the kind of love of those two kind of um, kind of looks and you know the Technicolor side of it wasn't necessarily a full on Technicolor kind of reproduction it was more of a color separation so I took 
I did a bunch of um, lookbooks and mood boards and stuff, and I took it to the post-production house earlier on just to kind of get to sort of feel out how we, you know, if this was achievable. And they said, definitely, you know, we can definitely, you know, heighten color separations and not make it feel too period, too too um, nostalgic in that kind of um, gauzy kind of um, oldie worldy kind of feel. Um so that, that, yeah, that's what we kind of ended up, I ended up pitching for Ryan and he ended up kind of really reacting to that. And um, there was another key reference that kind of came through from him early on as well was the George Horrell, who was a yeah. very famous portrait photographer for the for the movie stars. He was the go-to guy and actually features in the show, um, which was very exciting to recreate. But there was a one image that Ryan kind of sent to all the department heads and it was a a portrait of anime Wong, uh, who was the first like Asian movie star who had a great run in the 1920s. And she appears in this show a little bit washed up and, you know, down on our luck. So, so that, that image, which was actually a little bit, that's why it kind of spurred me to think about the film noir. Cause it had a very, very kind of film noir kind of uh, lighting style. And then I later discovered just through research that it was actually reproduction from a color print. So I looked at the color print. Really? Yeah, which was, you know, beautiful as well. But this, Anime Wong's famous for that portrait, if you want to Google it. Um, uh, I'm going to look it up right now. I'm, I'm looking at George Hurrell, Hurrell? I don't know if I'm saying Hurrell. And I'll put a link to this in the show notes. But yes, you've seen these photos before. I didn't, the name didn't spark any memory, but when I'm looking at the photos, I'm like, yes, this is the look of that time. Yes. Yeah. You know, old school Hollywood, 40s, like, or probably earlier here, yeah. but just, I mean, just gorgeous. Totally. Um, I mean, and other things that I was looking at, um, you know, I was trying to find projects and movies or TV shows that sort of were about the movie industry in that period. And there's not a lot, you know. Uh, I ended up latching on to things like... Um, uh, Barton Fink, um, you know, because that's that is definitely the Boulevard of Broken Dreams movie. You know, it's <laughs> uh, it's that slightly twisted too. But at the same time, you know, obviously, you know, Roger Deakins, you know, <laughs> God of of course, uh, of course, he kind of went down that path of that kind of you know that Harvest tone palette. So that was a great um, kind of reference uh, in a way. And then Hell Caesar, the more recent Coen Brothers movie, which actually. Um, lives exactly the same time period as Barton Fink. I don't know if you knew that. No. Yeah. So they live in the same world. This, the movie uh, studio that he goes to visit is the same studio in Hell Caesar, I believe. No way. Yeah. Um, so there was... I'm looking, at, I'm looking at stills as we talk, and I absolutely see that this was a valuable reference for you, for sure. Yeah. And weirdly, there was a little bit of a... Um, I, I kind of got a... a a, a sort of a, a, a message on that because it, um, I went to see Panavision and I went to see David Dodson to talk about, you know, the show and the look and what have you. And I was waiting in the uh, reception area and I'd been in there a few times and I never really noticed, but they all the way down the reception corridor was full size prints of George Horrell's work. Really? Even down to a little gold plaque that describes the stock he used, the T stop, you know, the lighting. So, wow. So I quickly ran down and took pictures of all of these plaques and pictures so I can kind of research how he was, you know, shooting these uh, movie stars. Um, and that was the other interesting thing about the show was, you know, the, the show's look had to be, especially with lighting, it had to feel glamorous, but at the same time grounded. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to mention to you that there's what's so great about the show is everyone's an actor. Everyone is, I mean, these, these are beautiful people, every single person in the show, but you're able to capture a vulnerability in these characters. And usually that's hard to do when people are so perfect and so beautiful and lit so well, Yeah, you, you lose the, you lose the human aspect on it and you, you lose the humanity in a way, mm -hmm. but I feel like this did not happen with this show. Good. That was, uh, that was the only element of the show that I wasn't questioning too heavily because I ultimately, we did want to make this feel, um, you know, gorgeous and glamorous, but yeah. we didn't want to lose sight of the drama. And if the lighting or any way, if the stylization of the lighting can be a little bit distracting, 
it can fall into parody, like I said earlier. Mm-hmm. So we were kind of riding that fine line um, on set. And, you know, and my, you know, one of my kind of challenge, well, it wasn't another challenge, but one of my kind of requests, as it were, uh, just by default with Ryan's, you know, shows is everyone had to look a million dollars, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, they had to look, you know, poor or, you know, up and coming or whatever. So, yep. so that, yeah. So a lot of challenges. Um, well, talk to me about how you're doing that. So, I mean, you're, mm-hmm. you're in a situation where you've got talent that are already great looking. You have to make them absolutely gorgeous because they are movie stars. Um, but you, you know, you need to keep them grounded, like you say. So how are you doing that? Could you just kind of walk us through, you know, the way you would, even the the way you would um you know treat just something simple like a couple of close ups some dialogue. I mean, how do you deal with that? It's tricky to answer that one because I, I I had to sort of rely on my faith that the final outcome from you know the on set shooting to the first pass that they would do on the kind of colorization, which was generally at the end of each day, to kind of you know because everything to me is like a layer of you know it's like peeling back an onion. You know everything's not just sure. the surface and the lighting. Did you have a standard, like a standard approach that obviously things change according to, you know, where the sun's coming in time of day, blah, blah, blah. But was there a standard approach to just like giving all of these faces that modeling that they need, but also that, you know, vulnerability, like we've been talking about? No, I mean, I I didn't feel it should apply to all, you know, I felt it had to be, uh, I mean, Dan Dan Minahan was one of the directors. He called some of these moments, the magic moments, you know, Hmm. where we would, actually heighten it a little further, you know, um, to make... Could you give us an example? Um, um, there's, a, there's a scene in, uh, in uh, Ace's office and uh, the, um, the daughter of the studio head comes and visits her mum yeah. and is told that he's, she's not got the part. And It's the one I saw last night. Well, there you go. And, you know, we deliberately you know, pushed in a very, very high key kind of, you know, George Horale-esque kind of um, key light onto, onto Claire Woods, who's playing, um, uh, sorry, just going blank. Um, oh, his daughter. I know. Now I can't, I can't think of it either. Um, Claire Woods. Well, the studio head's Mar- daughter. Sam- there you go. <laughs> Sam- went around. Samara Weaving is the actress and she played Claire Wood. And, um, just for that brief moment where there's a connection between uh, herself and her mother, I just made sure that she had the most beautiful key light in the world, you know, mm. uh, <clears throat> for Claire. And, you know, and I made sure that the mother was slightly backlit and a slightly, you know, she she wanted to be a movie star back in the day, her mother, and it didn't work out, you know. So I felt that there was times where I needed to give certain characters their moments to shine and certain moments for... Uh, to, to not shine in a way, you know, to help that arc of the story um, that ultimately leads towards, you know, um, the Academy Awards, which is the final episode. So, uh, and then we have the elements of the movie Meg, which is what the filmmakers are trying to make in the show. So I knew I also had to go one step further and actually get that movie looking like a classic, you know, black and white, you know, Hollywood movie. Yeah. So there were there were sort of it's degrees of on the day, and part of it is instinct, part of it's research and, and kind of preparation and discussions with the director and all, what have you. And then you know on top of that, there's time. You know, you know that when you're working on a TV schedule, you're not working on a movie schedule where you can take a little bit more time to kind of craft a close up. Um, there were certain things that we did slightly rely on in post. We had uh, some eye lifts that we did, very, very subtle, but they were kind of given to certain moments and certain characters. Uh, Jack, um, who is who is the character that sort of uh, springboards the, the series at the start, they did a little thing where they would just lift his eyes a little bit and almost raise the saturation of his baby blue eyes, just a little bit. Mm. In the show Hollywood... Um, they're making a movie called Meg. And there are scenes from Meg that we see. We see them being made. We also see the final output of that. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to us about the way that you created the look of that, like the the movie within the movie with Meg? It was a combination of, um, 
you know, lighting and research on, you know, the film look of that period and, you know, stocks and, you know, the studio space that they are in, you know, a lot of research on lighting and, you know, units that they would have used back then, but we don't have access to now. So I had to kind of recreate that with modern lights. So one of the things that we did earlier on was to kind of almost use uh, more, slightly more old school tungsten units to give it a little bit more grit and didn't feel too um, too shiny. Um, and then, you know, we were also plunging into like the ratio of that period, which was more 133 or 137. I can't quite remember between the two, which is, you know, it's, you know, Polaroid, you know, uh, yeah. uh, you know, kind of ratio. So that was interesting because we were shooting our entire show at 2.20 ratio, which is closer to widescreen. And so there were also discussions from Ryan about how we would come into the movie and come out of the movie. So we would start, you know, four, three, and then at some point it would creep and slowly open until we're finally into the movie and it's full screen, but still retaining that kind of, uh, that look that was so distinct. And I think, like I said, what I was saying earlier about the film noir references that was when we went full tilt film noir, you know. Um, some of the sequences was handed over to another cinematographer, um, lovely Blake McClure, McClure, who came in and helped out. Um, we had the Hollywood sign, which they, you know, recreated within the stage. Um, there's the reference back to, you know, Peg Untwistle, who was the original person it's based on, um, who jumps from the Hollywood sign and suicide. Um and yeah, and we and we kind of also you know wove in you know like um, sort of subtle breathing to the uh, projection. You know, talk to me about that. What wh how, what do you mean? It's almost like recreating as if you're watching it in the cinema rather than at home. You know, so the technology back then wasn't great. You know, when it came to the projection, so uh, Tanner, who was the post production colorist uh, at MTI, he kind of played around some stuff, and I kind of came in and he showed me some examples and. I kind of liked what he was doing. It was very subtle, uh, but it stood apart from, you know, the uh, the main show, you know. And also, like, we had screen tests on top of that in the show. So they had to be yeah. relating another look, which was a little bit closer to, you know, like the Marlon Brando screen tests uh, back then, you know. Uh, so they are a little bit more high key, a um, little bit more low budget felt feeling. Um, but movie, the make the movie, yeah, it was, it was a combination of a lot of things, you know, and, and, and what did you shoot it on? And we shot it on the Sony Venice. Like we shot the rest of the show on, you know, and oh, okay. we ended up, you know, the, the, the TV show was shot on Primo's and, um, I kind of, for the, for the certain moments I ended up using, you know, um, certain focal lengths, like 50 mil, 65 mils for, for certain parts of those, you know, uh, you know, those scenes. And Meg movie. What was your experience like with the Venice? Did you did you test anything else out? I did, but I loved it. I have to say, um, yeah, I was very surprised. Um, I was hearing great things about this camera, even in pre production and leading up to you know testing. Um, we were going to test a bunch of stuff, but because it's Netflix, we were handcuffed anything 4K and up. So um, you know, we were thinking about you know the uh, the LF, you know, and other cameras, but. I was in M MTI and the post house and they said to me, um, we were talking about the show and they said, oh, there's a show that's just coloring next door and they just shot it on the Venice. Would you like to have a look? And I was like, well, that's the perfect way to see an example of the show rather than testing it. Absolutely. So yeah, I went next door and honest to God, I think it was like 10 seconds that my jaw dropped and I was like, this is our show. You know, it was a you know, I think it was the, the, the kind of filmic color space of the camera. Yeah, that felt uh, like a little bit more advanced than other cameras I saw. I mean, we were definitely going to rely on a lot of color, you know, exaggeration, color expression in our show. So there was that. And also the camera comes with, a, uh, you know, some bonuses. You know, you've got the internal NDs, which you can flick through. That's you know, super fast. You've got the dual ISO. So it means you can shoot, a, you know, very kind of, you know, high key lighting, but also you can shoot a very, very, low light, you know, so the camera will go up to like 2,500 base, um, which I guess is equivalent to like candlelight if you needed that. Mm. Um, so the camera for me was just, I think it's more of a selling point of the color space, I have to say. It, it, it just felt 
like add a great texture to the image. Uh, and I just sort of knew straight away. It's just kind of that instinct, you know? That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it looks amazing. The, I think the biggest critique that Sony usually gets with their camera is that they're a little harsh and you need to soften, you need to soften a little bit. Did you find that on, on, on your project? We, uh, you know, we, we did use filtration in the show. Uh, it was actually called uh, Hollywood black magic, um, filter. Perfect. Fitting. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so that took the edge off it, definitely glowed the highlights and gave it that kind of slightly lush feel that I know that is sort of, you know, that's worked well in the past with Ryan shows. Um, and, um, sorry, what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> no, I was saying, I was saying that one of the bigger critiques of Sony just in general is that it's, it's a bit harsh. Harsh. Yeah. And, and I was wondering, did you find that with the Venice? And if so, how did you you know, change that. It's not, I mean, you, you answered right there. You said there was a, you were using that filter, but yes. Uh, I, yes, I was pleasantly surprised with the camera cause it did kind of shock me at just how subtle, um, or how advanced they've been, you know, working on the color space because I, I know yeah. relate Sony cameras and technology to being, yeah, like you said, very harsh, almost like plastic colors, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, I was just bowled over by how, you know, um, filmic the color space was. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, the other bonuses I spoke about, you know, with the dual ISO and stuff. But uh, yeah, yeah. Let, let's talk about um, some maybe of the other elements. You talked about the filtration haze. Were you using haze at points to kind of give it that softness? Yes, the crew hated me. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> Well, we, we kind of felt that it was necessary to use Haze a lot uh, just because we were kind of recreating that period, you know. Um, you know, there's elements in the show where, you know, everybody smokes, you know, there's a lot of characters smoking. So there's an inherent need for Haze in the space to kind of, uh, you know, kind of feed off that Hollywood look. So, yeah, in, in a word, we did. We did, we did not massive amounts, just enough to kind of give it that slight nod to the film noir expression, you know. Yeah. Uh, but without going too far. We mentioned earlier in the show this idea of that harvest look, the golden tones, but there's also some very bold colors in there. You see hard blues and reds, and there's a lot of color. And it's interesting to see because when you think of 1940s, you think of this black and white world, and you're kind of taking it, modernizing it, and incorporating these colors that we're kind of seeing today in filmmaking. Talk to me about the decision to do that and then how you achieve that look. Uh, I, I would sort of revert back to, you know, Ryan and his costume designs and, and, you know, set design because there was so much, you know, consideration and design and, and thought process going into that. You know, for instance, you've got the gas station, the golden tip gas station, you know, and, you know, all of the, uh, the pump jockeys are wearing, you know, these beautiful, you know, uh, yellow slash gold hats and then, you know, fresh white, you know, kind of tops. So that was all pre-designed, you know, and I, I, and I just recall that in the grade, we just, on the colorization, we just made sure that there was a cleaner separation and they popped a little bit more out, you know. So, yeah, and then, you know, other colors that were considered, you know, um, yeah, lots of reds here and there. Um, and I'm talking beyond the, the uh, set design and the costume design. I'm talking about, like, colored lights, like in the episode I saw last night, you went, I think they went into like uh, in the, in the opening episode, the first episode, yes. one of them, the movie theater that he goes into, it's got this red, like this hallway and it's all red. Yes. It's very deep. And then you have, you have these strong references to red as the see, as the episodes go as well. Mm -hmm. But there, it's almost like a, it's almost like a neon quality. Yes. That is, it's interesting to see that associated at that time period. Indeed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that felt, um, it was a deliberate choice that was kind of discussed between, you know, Ryan and, you know, our lighting department, you know, there was a signpost and we needed a signpost to say, you know, this is an underground porn theater or you know, yeah. an overground. And, um, you know, that was part of that. But again, you know, you, you just, you just try to put your faith in that it will help to tell the story and, wouldn't never feel too contemporary, you know? Um, I mean, for a large part of the shoot, we were using very contemporary lighting technology. We'd be using like Titan, Titans and sky panels just because I know that color is such an expressive part of Ryan's kind of uh, storytelling. 
Yeah. And his shows are, and even from the sequen, you know, from the directors that took over later, there's always an element of, you know, color expression. So, um, but that's, you know, part of that is also a little trick that I've sort of learned about underexposing the raw of the camera. Hmm. Not too far, but enough to give it a little bit of um, density and, um, you know, uh, to feel a little bit more um, rich, you know? So uh, that was also a part of that. But yeah, there, there was definitely like, um, you know, uh, definitely deliberate kind of color coding within the show. Talk to me more about the underexposing the blacks. I mean, how how far did you go? Was there a ratio you were working with? Yeah, we, we created, um, uh, me and my camera utility, um, we created four uh, underexposure range LUTs. So it went from half stop to a full stop to one and a half stops to two stops. So for instance, a day exterior, we could be going under two stops hmm. purely to retain the detail in, you know, the highlights and, you know, uh, a sky behind a character, what have you. Um, because I'm, you know, these cameras are, you know, very tolerant you know, uh, yeah, incredibly tolerant more, more than you think actually. Cause even when you've done that, there's more to go. So, you know, I mean, we, we did some tests and I took them into MTI and made sure that the, you know, color space, sorry, the, the, you know, the exposure range is the same for the Sony as it was for, um, you know, the, uh, the Alexa mini, which I'd shot past shows on with Ryan. And, uh, I would still, you know, use the same trick with the uh, the Alexa. So we were pleasantly surprised at the range of this camera. Um, but, yeah, I pretty much applied that to the entire show, which kind of, I'm hoping, gives it that kind of rich texture, you know, rather than being too healthy and exposed, if that makes sense. It absolutely does. Like, it, the, the richness... It's interesting to hear you say that, that you just plain underexposed instead of crushing it down in post. Although you probably crushed it a little bit too, but. Yeah, but I, you know, I didn't, didn't have any kind of color correction alerts on set. You know, like mm -hmm. I said, you know, everything that, you know, uh, woven into the set as far as color predetermined pre colors was already there. So I didn't run up a mess with the color space too much on set, you know, even though I knew we would go potentially in certain directions with certain scenes. So yeah, I would just basically take a underexposure lot with us out every day and, you know, it worked out great. Let's talk about the lens choices for Hollywood. Did you, you mentioned Primos beforehand. Um, any customization done to them? I know that's very popular right now. We thought about it and uh, did a bunch of tests and Panavision said that they could detune them, uh, which was an early concept because I think they wanted to, you know, really go down that kind of nost true nostalgic feel. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the lenses they were bringing in were, you know, old lenses from the MGM days, you know, just for us to look at and, and kind of, and they're so degraded and old now, there's nothing to kind of see. But, but it, you know, for me, I didn't feel the show. I, I thought, you know, Ryan's need to make this feel contemporary in some an accessible, more accessible than just being, you know, uh, a show about, you know, that period yeah. was to not really mess with it too much. If honest, I kind of liked, you know, I've used, we, I used Primo's on uh, Peaky Blinders and I kind of know, I know where I stand with those lenses. They got a great contrast ratio, you know, um, and you know, they're very dependable and, and simple too. You know, they've got a great look. Um, you know, we kept the show probably around T 2.8, T4. Um, we didn't really go too far down, you know, too shallow look. I kind of felt the show should have kind of like the movies back then, a little bit more classical kind mm. of camera presentation, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. And plus, I mean, my God, the set design. The last thing you want to do is defocus those beautiful sets. I mean, you want to see <laughs> everything when you're watching a yeah. Ryan Murphy project. Indeed. It's funny you should say that because that, I have conversations about this to people and part... Part of the thing with the shallow depth of field would look, which is, you know, it has its moments. And I think of that is beautiful. But what you are doing, whether you, you know or not, is that you're stealing from the production designer. And I mean that in the kindest sense. 
you know, you're taking away, like you said, you, you, if you if you defocus that set to the point where it's, you know, you, you're not seeing much, then you've lost, you know, so much, you know, great storytelling tools, you know, and, and a beautiful set. So, yeah, so that, that again, is another great testament to Ryan is that all the sets and the, you know, they were beautiful. You know, we had the, um, uh, you know, we had the commissary. We had the, you know, a lot of the, we, we you know, we shot like 65%, I'd say, of the show uh, was probably on stage. Mm. And we shot at Sunset Gower Studios. And, um, you know, a lot of the studio uh, interiors, you know, the uh, A Studios interiors were uh, on stage. And, yeah, they're just beautiful, you know. We had a, a Schwab's yeah. drugstore. We had Jack's apartment. And then, you know, we had... You know, we had two stages that were for the main standing sets, and then we had two stages that were for revolving sets that would come in and out, you know, for brief, you know, needs. And, um, you know, we were recreating beautiful um, uh, screen tests, uh, Anime Wong being particular one where, you know, um, she's, you know, giving an amazing screen test. And, you know, that was a lot of fun because we had, you know, period props and cameras and, movie lights and, um, you know, and stuff like that. You know, we were recreating a thing called Mr. Cooper's Widow, which was actually another movie within the show. Um, um, and then I mentioned earlier, like George Horao, you know, we got his stuff, you know, that that was in there. Um, and yeah, actually yeah. tried to recreate, you know, as best as we could based on research, you know, his, um, his lighting setups. Yeah, I saw in... I think it was the episode I saw last night. They were rubbing baby oil on yes. the face. <laughs> was that a real trick? That was a real trick they used back in the day, and it made the light stick to hit their face, as he says. Um, wow. So, yeah, little tricks. Um, you know, I think the actress would break out the next day, but he quite needed, <laughs> and they look fantastic. Oh, my God. I want to talk about uh, your choice or your choice to move or not move the camera yes. in Hollywood. Um, talk to me a little bit about that because I found it interesting. Yeah. The, the restraint in a way, it's like there are certain scenes where you have these absolutely beautiful establishing shots that feel very Hollywood, very cinematic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are moments where it feels restrained and I'd love to talk to you about those decisions. Yeah. I mean, part of that was actually just, just research of the movies back in those days, you know, um, and, you know, I, what did I watch that sort of stood out? I mean, the best years of our lives, a William Wyler movie, there's not a camera movement until like 20 minutes into the movie. And it's mm. completely deliberate. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with a 45 minute episode, you know, uh, mini series. So, yeah, we were definitely restraining the camera. And, you know, a lot of that came through decisions of scene to scene with the director, you know, and we had um, we had five directors on this show. And, um, you know, each director had their own interpretation of, you know, when we moved the camera. Uh, we did a few scenes where, you know, the director chose to kind of keep the camera, you know, just gently rolling, you know, just gently moving. And then we would, like, just hold back, you know, and restrain it. And, and own, I mean, Ryan's um, episode in particular, you know, he has a very, very deliberate kind of um, mantra when it comes to, like, you know, camera movements and punctuation of, of lines and emotions. Um, so I would say, you know, the first episode probably had a little bit more kind of movement than the other episodes. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was, it's, it's weirdly, it is a weirdly restrained show in that way. You know, it yeah. lets the sets and the costumes and the great dialogue just do all the work for you, you know? I, there were moments too. And I think it was when we saw like the, um, the soda shop or, or the, mm -hmm whatever you got, where Schwab. you'd have this really giant wide shot way up high mm -hmm. and you're thinking like it's the beginning of a move, but it isn't. No. It just stays there. Yeah. And uh, choices like that are so great because it, you have this expectation of what the shot's going to be. And when it doesn't do it, it makes you even notice it more. It, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I just have a firm belief anyway on any show that I work on that, you know, camera, camera movement should be completely justified and deliberate. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of just, you know, just constantly moving the camera just to keep the story moving. So, yeah, we did a lot of stuff where we would use a crane on set, but it would just to get to an elevated composition, you know. 
and just yeah. finding a beautiful composition of that beautiful set and saying this is telling the story. Um, you know, we had Meg the movie, which we did a lot of kind of, you know, boom shots coming up to the character on, you know, the Hollywood sign and things like that. So th- there was moments where we definitely, you know, punctuated movement in a very, very big way. But, um, yeah, restraint goes a lot more, you know, goes a long way. <laughs> you know, less is more, right? <laughs> and actually on that note, the table read scene was absolutely gorgeous. And there's really nothing in that studio except for a table with the actors and that's it. And it was, it was such a, it was such like a, like a refreshing way to show that process. And it was beautiful. And I was watching that um, either last night or the night before. And I'm like, damn it. Like the, he made such a mundane, boring moment when people do these table reads into this absolutely beautiful, uh, this scene. It, it, it's just, it's amazing what you were able to do with that. Totally. It's one of my favorite scenes, actually. I'm fun, funny you should mention it. Yeah. I was very proud of that when it, you know, finally came out in the edit. Um, well, for the people that haven't seen it, maybe talk to us a little bit about you know, what made that scene so distinct? I mean, the top lighting certainly is the big thing for me. Yeah. I mean, from, from a technical standpoint, we kept it super simple. I just wanted one giant soft box and just let the kind of, you know, the background recede off into not complete darkness, but you know, kind of mood. And, yeah. um, it's the first time you see all of the key characters that are, you know, are chasing their dreams as it were in this TV show. And they're sat around this, you know, as you say, like for a table read, and it's also the first time that you're seeing them perform, you know, mm. the lines as scripted. And it's very, very powerful. And it's, you know, you're getting a precursor to what would be the movie they would shoot. So yeah. it's hugely important that it was emotional. And, you know, Michael Uppendor is the director. Yeah, we kind of, you know, part of the, you know, there's a lot of architectural wides that we shot. You know, some of the wides that we shot kind of reminded me of Dr. Strangelove for some reason. <laughs> um yeah. And then, you know, we just plowed in and got as much, you know, this is a three camera shoot. So, you know, yeah. I would use the cameras a lot in, I guess I'm hoping in a very, very smart way. You know, we would definitely deliberately shoot in one direction for lighting and continuity, but we, we just started breaking it down and, you know, uh, trying to kind of get the camera to move around, say ahead to reveal, you know, a certain character, a certain line of the dialogue. It's, it's, you know, it's an interesting scene because the camera sl- just is gently creeping through the uh, the lines, you know, the, the emotions. Yeah. Which I kind of loved. It was a very smart decision from Michael, the director. It was absolutely beautiful. I mean, the whole show is incredible. I am so excited to, like, it's one of those shows I don't want to binge it because I want it to last. <laughs> I want it to last longer. Um, yeah, I have, I, have a, I had a friend in England and he wanted to watch it and then talk to me about it. And he just... He was the same. It's like, we're, we're trying not to watch the next episode. <laughs> but that's a testament to Ryan, you know, and it's, you know, I'm dead proud of the show. It's, um, you know, it kind of ticks all the boxes. And I think, you know, you made a question earlier on about like, you know, references to not feel too modern and stuff. And I think that it rides the line nicely, you know, as a show. Absolutely. It kind of, it's, it's, you know, the, the key thing for Ryan was, you know, optimism, 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 you know, it, no matter how hard the storylines get and how dark it has to have a flavor of optimism. And I think that's part of the photography was always, I was always conscious of that kind of note, you know, of never going too far, never going too dark, you know, phys, you know, lighting, you know, uh, wise and what have you, I kind of felt that it needed to ride a kind of very, you know, distinct line of just being entertaining, you know, and, um, you know, kind of, it will grab you, you know, like you say, and you're just kind of eager to watch the next part of the story. Well, I don't want to end the show without at least making an acknowledgement of Jem Biscuits on Twitter, who did ask a question to you. Did any movies from the 1940s time period influence the cinematography? I think we talked a little bit about that earlier in the show, but if we can just kind of end the episode with that, I just want to yeah. make sure that question's heard. I would say, um, I think notorious, uh, Hitchcock's notorious was in there for me. Hmm. And then I think it's hard to choose between these three, but you know, the red shoes and black, you know, black Narcissus, both shot by Jack Cardiff, um, who is a, I'm a big fan of, uh, and then maybe a little bit of Gone with the Wind, just purely on a, a, a Technicolor aesthetic, not a, you know, a, a kind of a literal reference. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, between 
I'd say notorious and, you know, red shoes if I had to pick. All right. Well, thank you for your question, Gem Biscuits. In the show, Hollywood, it's on Netflix. You can watch it right now and you should because it's absolutely stunning and amazing and fantastic and brilliant and looks so good. And uh, it's because of Simon Dennis. So thank you so much, Simon, for being on the show. Thank you so much. It's been great. All right, I want to thank Simon Dennis, BSC, the director of photography for Hollywood, for coming on the show and teaching us a little bit about how he does his thing. Of course, I want to thank Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. You can find him at GainStructure at GainStructure.com. And of course, our producer, Connor Crosby, at IgnitionVisuals.com, IgnitionVisuals.com. I also want to thank our sponsors, MZ Education for Creatives and Post Lab, stress-free collaboration for Final Cut Pro 10 and Premiere. Without these guys, the show wouldn't exist, so please support those that support us. Head over to GoCreativeShow.com for the show notes from today's episode and all previous episodes. And it also will be uh, will give you access to all of our social media profiles, which you should be following, especially Instagram and Twitter. I'm sorry, Instagram and YouTube, especially because we're doing a lot of fun stuff with those. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. And we'll see you next week on another episode of Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. 